Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our monthly address. First of all, if you have one of these infernal machines, would you please render it silent or otherwise innocuous, uh, or turn it off? And that would be uh, very useful because we don't want interruptions. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, Major General Mark Kelly. He's a Duntroon graduate, graduated into the infantry, and during that time he served in Rhodesia. Uh, later on, in 1990, he was at the Staff College and then uh, became uh, the major, the Brigade Major of 3rd Brigade. He had various staff appointments and then became the CO of the 1st Battalion Royal Australian Regiment. Subsequently, he was with the deployable joint, uh, the deployable mm. joint force, and served with Interfet in East Timor. <coughs> As a brigadier, he commanded three brigades, and then he was uh, director of combined planning at the U.S. Central Command in Tampa, Florida, which must have been a hard one to take, I think. Um, he was promoted to Major General, commanded the 1st Division, and then he was Chief of Staff, Joint Force Headquarters, and in 2005 he was the Land Commander of Australia. He was awarded, the, uh, he was awarded a member of the Order of Australia in 2000 and an officer of the Order in 2008, and he also received the US Legion of Merit. In 2009, he was commander of the Joint Task Force 633 uh, in command of Australian forces in the Middle East. In 2000, and, and, and after that, he uh, became um, the, the, Australia, the uh, land commander, Australian land commander. In 2010, he became the, he left the army and became the repatriation commissioner, a position that he now holds. And he's going to talk to us this morning about the uh, commission and the work they do with uh, return servicemen and clients such as me and many of you in the room, I'm sure. So thank you, Mark. We look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Warren, for that introduction, and uh, to Marcus for uh, the invitation earlier in the year to join you today, and to what would appear to be hopefully a room of satisfied clients from the Department and the Repatriation Commission. But I had the good fortune of uh, serving for 36 years in the Australian Army, and in the infantry our focus has uh, always been the soldiers, and that's uh, broadly the case across the Army and the other services of our Defence Force. But I had the distinct privilege of serving those soldiers in a variety of uh, levels of command, platoon, company, battalion, brigade, division, then Land Command Australia, and of course in my final appointment as the Commander of Joint Task Force 633, commanding all our young men and women of the three services deployed in the Middle East area of operations, Iraq and Afghanistan. So I consider myself very fortunate to have had the career that I had but my focus was always serving those under my command as opposed to them serving me. And in this current appointment that I've been given the privilege to hold, I can continue that work in my post-service life, looking after the interests of those young men and women that are still serving, that are indeed our clients, but of course those great generations of veterans that the department has had a history of serving uh, throughout its almost 100 years. So I'll not attempt to try and cover every detail today in my presentation this afternoon, but will hopefully give you an understanding of the roles of the Repatriation Commission and the Department of Veterans Affairs and leave time for your questions. But first, a little history. In 1918, thousands of Australian soldiers were due to return from the fighting in France, Belgium and the Middle East. 
Their experiences did not prepare them for a return to normal life. Many were scarred or disabled, both physically and or mentally. Many more required some form of assistance to adjust to a world without war. As early as 1914, Senator Edward Millen had proposed a plan for a government-funded war pension scheme. It had been a concern of Australians since the Boer War. Senator Millen described repatriation of returned service personnel as a cause worthy of the last shilling. As the war progressed and more and more injured and sick veterans returned home, the government of the day realised a thorough and comprehensive repatriation system was required in order to prepare these soldiers for a return to civilian life, to ease the transition and to meet their needs in the years that followed the war. With no other model to follow, Senator Millen designed an entirely new system encompassing health care, compensation, soldier settlement and vocational training. This was done as an earnest attempt to meet the nation's obligations to those who had served. On the 8th of April 1918, the Repatriation Department was established. Since then, the Repatriation Commission, the Department of Veterans Affairs and now the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Commission have worked to meet the needs of veterans serving and former serving members of the Australian Defence Force, widows, widowers and dependents. Demographics of the veteran community have changed significantly over the years. With nearly 900,000 serving overseas in the armed forces during the Second World War, there was a very large group of eligible veterans for the Department of Veterans Affairs to support. As that group gradually aged, DVA became a major player in addressing health issues for the entire ageing Australian population. DVA is one of the oldest departments in the Commonwealth starting life as the Repatriation Department and becoming in 1976 the Department of Veterans Affairs to reflect its wider functions, including administration of the Defence Services Home Scheme and the Office of the Australian War Graves. In 1986, many different acts that formed the repatriation legislation were consolidated into the Veterans Entitlement Act 1986. And in 2004, the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission was established under the auspices of the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 2004 to provide benefits to current and former members injured or ill due to their service after the 1st of July 2004 and also their dependents. The following slides will now step you through a potted history of the Commission and the Department. The War Pension Act was introduced in 1914. This provided for medical treatment of war caused disabilities and for the payment of war pensions. And in the case of the death of a member to the widow, children and other dependents as defined. The War Pensions Act was then consolidated into the Australian Soldiers Repatriation Act in 1917. The Repatriation Department was established and began operation on the 8th of April 1918. Senator Millen was the first Minister for Repatriation. Payment of pensions were brought into the scope of the Repatriation Commission in 1920. Special rate pensions were introduced for those who were totally and permanently incapacitated or blinded. Paid Repatriation boards were established, one in each state, consisting of three members, and the duty conferred upon these repatriation boards was determining claims for pensions. Provision was also made for the right of appeal to the Repatriation Commission in respect of claims rejected by repatriation boards. In 1921, the Soldiers' Children Education Scheme was introduced for the benefit of children of deceased members and members totally and permanently incapacitated. The development of the repatriation treatment services commenced. Institutions established by the Department of Defence were transferred to the repatriation department. 
the major hospitals became the Repatriation General Hospitals. The department was also a leading developer and producer of prosthetic limbs. Service pensions were first paid under the Australian Soldiers Repatriation Act of 1935 by the Commonwealth Government. This act was introduced with effect the 1st of January 1936, offering income support five years earlier than the age pension in recognition of veterans' special needs. Eligibility preventions of the legislation were extended to include Second World War veterans in 1942 and the provision of pharmaceutical benefits through local pharmacists began in 1946. In 1950, legislation was amended to include Korean and Malayan War veterans with operational service, which was later incorporated into the Repatriation Far East Strategic Reserve Act of 1956. In 1952, the Disabled Members and Widows Training Scheme was established to provide rehabilitation training to enable ex-servicemen of the Second World War who were substantially handicapped through war-caused incapacity to be satisfactorily re-established to civil life and for widows of ex-servicemen of that war if training was necessary to enable them to follow suitable remunerative occupation. The the Repatriation Special Overseas Act was introduced in 1962. This related to special service which was service in or when proceeding to or from a proclaimed area affected by warlike operations, while allotted for duty directly related to those operations from the 31st of July of that year. The proclaimed areas comprised of an area in the north of Malaya and the southern zone of Vietnam. 1965 saw the introduction of the intermediate rate, which was payable under the first schedule of the Act, to a member who, because of incapacity resulting from war-caused disabilities, is capable only of engaging in part-time or intermittent employment. The central office of the department, still known at that stage as the Repatriation Department, moved to Canberra from Melbourne in January of 1970. The Repatriation Department then became the Department of Veterans Affairs on the 22nd of September 1976. And legislation was enacted that year for the main disability pensions to be indexed to the Consumer Price Index from the 4th of November. From the 1st of May 1978, the Repatriation Boards and the Commission commenced giving reasons for decisions in assessment cases. On the 23rd of May 1980, the Wargraves Act was passed in Parliament. The Act recognised the establishment, care and maintenance of Australian Wargraves and created the position of the Director of the Office of Australian Wargraves. And Australia has contributed to the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission for that purpose internationally. And the Office of the Australian Wargraves looks after some of the Commonwealth Wargraves cemeteries, particularly those in Papua New Guinea. In 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Counselling Service was established, the VVCS. Members of the Australian peacekeeping forces serving overseas became eligible for repatriation compensation. In the 1983 budget, $100,000 was allocated for retrospective payment of repatriation disability pensions to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander veterans of the Second World War who had previously been paid at lower rates than other Australian veterans between 1943 and 1962. 1985 saw the abolition of the Repatriation Boards and the Repatriation Review Tribunal, and the Veterans Review Board was established by the Repatriation Legislation Amendment Act of 1984 and became effective from the 1st of January 1985. On the 22nd of May 1986, the Senate passed the Veterans Entitlement Act of 1986. 
Many changes to the Act included the Guide to Assessment of Rates for Veterans Pensioners, known as GARP. Some of you may have heard that term before, which was approved by the Minister. And the Veterans Children Education Scheme, the VCS, was approved and tabled in Parliament also by the Minister. In 1987, the government announced the policy to divest the repatriation hospitals and facilities. And this policy implement, was implemented over the subsequent, nine year, uh, the subsequent nine years, which saw the repatriation hospitals handed back to state governments. In 1994, the Repatriation Medical Authority and the Specialist Medical Review Council, so the RMA and the SMRC, were established. From the 1st of June of 1994, all new claims were subject to the Statement of Principles, or SOPS, issued by the RMA or determinations issued by the Commission. On the 1st of January 1999, the Gold Card was extended to veterans of Australian Defence Forces and mariners who served in Australia's Merchant Navy during the Second World War who were aged 70 and over and who had incurred danger from hostile forces of the enemy. And on the 3rd of December 1999, the Military Compensation and Rehabilitation Scheme, the MCRS, was formally transferred to the Department of Veterans Affairs from Defence as agreed by the Prime Minister. Under this arrangement, DVA would provide claims management and rehabilitation services for the MCRS while policy and defence management issues remained the responsibility of the Department of Defence. From the 1st of July 2002, the Government extended full access to the Repatriation Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme to British Commonwealth and Allied veterans aged over 70 years with qualifying service from the Second World War. This was known as the Orange Card. And from the 1st of July of the same year, the government also extended the gold card to Australian veterans over 70, aged 70 years and over with post-Second World War qualifying service. In 2003, the report of the Review of Veterans Entitlement, known as the Clark Review, chaired by the Honourable John Clark QC, was presented to the Minister for Veterans Affairs. On the 1st of July 2004, the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 2004 came into effect, or the MRCA as we refer to it. And in 2007, the Vietnam Veterans Counselling Service, the VVCS, had a name change to become the Veterans and Veterans Families Counselling Service, also known as VVCS, with a silent F, providing broader services to veterans as well as their families. So that's just a quick potted history of the evolution of the legislation and the, and, the, um, and the history of the Department and the Commission. Now the demographics of the veteran community has changed significantly over the course of the 95 year history of the Commission and the Department. In general terms, our client dependency we group into three waves. The first wave is our surviving First World War widows, of which we have almost 160 as clients of the department. These wonderful Australians aged from in their early to mid-80s. So these young ladies were born in the 30s, clearly a great catch for a First World War veteran at, at marrying age some years later, as well as wonderful old widows well in excess of 100 years old. The first wave also includes our Second World War veterans, of which we have approximately 67,000 still as clients of the department. Sadly, that number was 100,000 when I first came into the appointment on the 1st of July 2010, and we are just losing that great generation each year uh, as they reach that age. Uh, we also have our World War II widows, which is approximately 80,000 of those wonderful ladies. And we also, in the first wave group, our Korean War veterans. The second wave is our Vietnam War generation and their widows. 60,000 served in the Vietnam War, and we have approximately 43,000 of those veterans as our clients 
plus their widows. The third wave, as we describe it, is the younger generation of veterans from our contemporary conflicts. This includes veterans from all our commitments post-1975, the Gulf War, Namibia, Cambodia, Somalia and Rwanda. However, it is interesting to note that since 1999, when Peter Cosgrove led the Interfet mission into East Timor and the subsequent engagements in Iraq, Afghanistan, of course, East Timor again, we have had over 65,000 young men and women of the Australian Defence Force gain qualifying or warlike service in those theatres. And that's not to mention the other servicemen and women, including reservists, with non-warlike service in the Solomon Islands and other smaller peacekeeping missions. Therefore, our oldest clients are widows and indeed some Second War veterans over 100 years old. And our youngest clients are sadly the young children born earlier this year to the widows of some of our Afghanistan soldiers killed in action late last year. So the span of responsibility of the Commission and the Department is quite stark. Each group or wave has different needs and different expectations. The Military Rehabilitation Compensation Scheme has established a 21st century framework to meet the very different needs of new generations of veterans and serving members, as well as maintaining appropriate service services for all our older cohorts of veteran clients. The legislation that we deal with within the department and uh, the commissions. The Veterans Entitlement Act, which I mentioned earlier, was passed in 1986. It was a consolidation of the many different acts that had previously formed the repatriation legislation. It was focused primarily on warlike service overseas. The Safety, Rehabilitation and Compensation Act, or the CIRCA, it covers all Commonwealth employees and it effectively covered peacetime injuries and illness to all those servicemen and women before the 1st of July 2004. And with effect the 1st of July 2004, the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Act, or the MRCA, which covers servicemen and women from enlistment through to death. One of the reasons why the Howard government at the time uh, proceeded with the tabling of a new legislation, the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Act, was the Black Hawk crash in 1996. Some of, the, of those killed in the accident, due to their length of service, were covered under VEA, and others were covered under CIRCA, and there was a disparity between the entitlements of their dependents. The, uh, the Howard government at the time determined we needed a single piece of legislation that covered servicemen and women in peace and war from enlistment to to death, hence the murka. So we have, for all those that enlisted from the 1st of July 2004, uh, managed under a single piece of legislation. However, there are many of our clients who are covered by two, possibly all three of those acts on the slide. They are more complex to, to deal with, but manageable nonetheless. Now, the entities who manage these acts to ensure benefits and entitlements flow to the veterans are now listed on this slide. The Repatriation Commission is responsible under the Veterans Entitlement Act for granting pensions, allowances and other benefits, providing treatment and other services and generally administering the Veterans Entitlement Act. There are three commissioners on the Repatriation Commission. We are statutory appointments. There is the President, the Deputy President and the Commissioner. The Commissioner is also referred to as the Services Member of the Repatriation Commission. That's the appointment that I feel. For a Commission hearing, all three must be present. There is no quorum below three. It must always be three. The Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission. It's responsible for the administration of benefits and arrangements under the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Act of 2004. This commission also determines and manages claims relating to defence service under the Safety Rehabilitation Compensation Act of 1988, the CIRCA, and its pre predecessors. 
The responsibility of Circa had previously been with the Repatriation Commission. It uh, migrated to the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission when it was established in 2004. There are five members of the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission, the Chairman and four other members. The Chairman is in fact the President of the Repatriation Commission. Two of the members are the Deputy President and the Commissioner from the Repatriation Commission. The fourth member is the Head of People Capability, Major General Gerard Fogarty from the Department of Defence. And the fifth member is a Senior Executive from the De uh, Department of Employer and Workplaces Relations, which is the department responsible for ComCare, which is the agency that manages the Safety Rehabilitation Compensation Act. As a result of the review in 2010 into the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Act, it was recommended and government accepted the recommendation to appoint a sixth member of the Commission. And the recommendation also included that that sixth member should be another representative of the Department of Defence. And subject to uh, Executive Council approval, that sixth member will be the Commander of Joint Health from the Department of Defence, Rear Admiral Robin Walker. The Department of Veterans Affairs, under the direction of the two commissions, DVA provides wide-ranging programs and services that can be broadly grouped into three main areas – care, compensation and commemorations. This next slide outlines the services provided by DVA. DVA is the primary service delivery agency responsible for developing and implementing programs that assists the veteran and defence force communities. It provides administrative support to the two commissions and is responsible for advising the commissions on policies and programs for beneficiaries and administering these policies and programs. The department has gone from running repatriation general hospitals to become one of Australia's largest purchasers of medical services. With many of our clients entering the latter years of their lives, or as I like to describe it, being more developed in years. DVA also became a major player in addressing health issues for an ageing Australian population. Mental health care has also become a priority, moving from institutionalisation to professional counselling through the Veterans and Veterans Family Counselling Service, as well as lifestyle programs, peer support and major research. This slide outlines some of the new initiatives to reach out to our veterans, as well as currently serving personnel and their families who may need support due to mental health issues they are dealing with. The secret to any of these mental health conditions is early intervention. They are manageable with early intervention. You can see from this, as a result of the uh, budget this year, there's an increased eligibility to include our young men and women that have been engaged in border protection tasks as part of Operation Resolute and its previous operations, to include those involved in natural disasters relief operations, including our reservists, such as bushfire and flood relief, for self-referral to VVCS. All serving men and women can, in fact, be referred to VVCS under an agreement for services we have with the Department of Defence but certain veterans with qualifying service always had a self-referral, and the budget measure this year increased that eligibility to pick up other groups. It still doesn't cover all of them yet, and that will be a decision for subsequent governments to increase where all people are covered the same way. Uh, there's been a great deal of work and a lot of money spent on increasing our capacity to reach out to the younger generation. The ADE's website, is a self-help tool uh, available for mental health. It provides access for families. It provides access for young men and women and veterans. It, uh, it obviously provides advice and information to providers as well so that they can understand some of the circumstances that young men and women may have confronted during their operational experience or service life. The Operation Life Online is a link within that site and that's uh, to increase suicide awareness and uh, identify places for support and help for those people with service uh, experience that may be confronting uh, situations of self-harm. Uh, we've extended our reach to them with some uh, YouTube videos 
on mental health conditions like PTSD, anxiety, anger, um, all those sorts of things, alcohol misuse, with a view of them seeing those clips, those are available through the DVA site, but also broadly uh, you can Google those. And again, with uh, veterans explaining their situation so that people can actually come to terms, well, I'm experiencing similar things, where do I go for help? The PTSD coach is a smartphone application or Android, depending on the brand that you use. And that's a, it's, it's, it's been Australianised. Uh, it was originally a, a US uh, application. Uh, but we finish most sentences on the application now with A, so it's very Australian. Uh, and um, it's actually people can step through a question and answer. And we've got many providers actually using the PTSD coach with their clients. So again, it's a very positive tool. And the Right Mix application, the Right Mix had been available through uh, the department for a number of years, but it's now a, a phone application and people can actually see what's a sensible use of alcohol if they're going off for a night out, those sorts of things. The department also provides a significant research funding into mental health as well as and also part of the operating budget to the Australian Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health which is centred here in the psychiatry department of the University of Melbourne. It's a nationally and internationally recognised uh, research centre into post-traumatic mental health and uh, they develop evidence-based treatments as well, in, as well as training programs for providers including our VVCS counsellors and out outreach providers as well. In addition to that, DVA also administers other legislation such as the Defence Services Home Act 1918 and the War Graves Act of 1980. This next slide gives you an outline of the DVA annual budget. As you can see there, I mentioned that uh, the department is a um, A significant purchaser of health care, $5.5 billion annually. $6.8 billion goes into uh, income support and compensation payments to our veteran clients. The demographic is approximately 320000 in that. And the one piece that's missing on the bottom of the slide for some reason uh, is the department's operating budget, which is $290 million. Now, when governments... Uh, impose efficiency dividends on Commonwealth agencies, the only area of the Department of Veterans Affairs budget that's affected by an efficiency dividend is the $290 million operating budget. The, the other $12.3 billion of that $12.6 are what is known as administered funds. They are funds guaranteed by legislation. So add into the forward estimates that money of $6.8 billion for income support and compensation and $5.5 billion for the health care is guaranteed. If for whatever reason, change of fees or something like that, we went above $5.5 billion for health care in a calendar year, the government would still pay it. Finance would probably not be too happy with the Department of Veterans Affairs for not getting its forward estimates right, but it is enshrined in legislation. So the only element affected by an efficiency dividend is the uh, department's operating budget of about $290 million. That includes staff salaries, that includes commercial property lease, leases for our offices, that includes travel and some of the commemorations money. Now, the Commissioner or Service Member, that's uh, myself. Uh, it's a statutory appointment, as is the three Commissioners on the Repatriation Commission and the five soon to be six members of the Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission. Uh, my predecessors were appointed for three year tenures. Uh, that changed with my appointment, it became a five year tenure. And I could say having tripped over the three year mark on the 30th of June this year, that uh, I'm still learning. So what uh, my predecessors were able to achieve in the three years I could say, even though some of them did uh, a double term and did six years in the role, uh, I would have been sort of looking back, having been busy in the three years, but still learning more and more and contributing more as you go along. Now, I have a number of commissions, uh, boards and committees that I either sit on 
or indeed chair myself, and I'll just share those with you now. So I sit on 16 commissions, boards or committees at uh, the, the, the level. The Repatriation Commission uh, meets every fortnight. The Military Rehabilitation Compensation Commission uh, meets monthly. And we also deal with matters out of session. So plenty of reading for each of those with large folders prepared for the different branches seeking endorsement or approval of matters that affect uh, veterans' entitlements and benefits. I am a director on the board of the Australian Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health, so I'm a great advocate of what that centre does. I'm also a director on the board of the Centre for Military and Veterans Health, which is another research centre centred on the medical schools of the University of Queensland, the University of Adelaide and Charles Darwin University in Darwin. I'm a director on the board of the Defence Services Home Insurance, and I'm also on the Gallipoli Scholarship Fund board. I'm a member of the Executive Management Group, which is the Senior Management Committee on the Department of Veterans Affairs. I sit on our signature National Consultative um, uh, Committee, which is the Ex-Service Organisation Roundtable, or ESO Roundtable. I also attend the Prime Minister's Advisory Council on Ex-Service Matters. I'm a member of the DVA Defence Links Steering Committee, which is our senior committee where we are working very closely with Defence to ensure the transition of servicemen and women leaving service are neatly handed over. So many of our procedures and policies have been refi refined through the auspices of that committee. I'm on the National Advisory Committee of the Veterans and Veterans Family Counselling Service, on the Commemorations Program Board, I'm on the, the Veterans Health Steering Committee, the Gallipoli Bilateral Conferences with New Zealand, which we just held in Canberra for two days earlier this week. I'm on the Gallipoli Interdepartmental Working Party, which is with our other Commonwealth agencies that provide support for our offshore commemorative events in Gallipoli. And I'm on the Gallipoli Reflective Program Advisory Board. And then I chair 11 committees, which include many of our other next tier of uh, national consultative framework, where we have ex-service organisation national bodies with their representatives at those committees. The National Mental Health Forum is one of those. They meet quarterly. Most of those other committees that I mentioned on the others are quarterly or six weekly. The, uh, ER, the Emerging Issues Forum for current and former serving members. The Vietnam Veterans Family Study Consultative Forum, I chair that. The Timor Les Family Study Consultative Forum, again, I chair that. The Commemorative Grants Committee, or the Salute the Service Grants, I chair that uh, committee for those grants that go out to ex service uh, and uh, community groups around the country. The Research Committee of the Department, we manage a research uh, funding annually of about $4.5 million that goes towards our signature research uh, projects through uh, centres of excellence like ACPMH and other universities around the country for veteran-related uh, matters. The research seminar, the Gulf War Serum Management Committee, the study on the health of aircraft maintenance personnel, which is Showhamp, the F-111 maintainers from the reseal, deseal uh, cohort, their Serum Management Committee. I chair the Commemorative Mission Selection Committee for veterans that attend our commemorative missions when they are conducted, and the Men's Peer Health Education Annual Conference. So between the 16 that I sit on, the 11 that I chair, in addition to that, I also chair another not-for-profit, which is the Royal Australian Regiment Foundation Fund, which is a separate uh, group, again. That's in my spare time. Uh, I also attend all the national and state congresses of the RSL and the other national congresses or annual general meetings of our other national ex-service organisations be it the Vietnam Veterans Association, the Vietnam Veterans Federation, uh, Legacy, War Widows and the like. So, and that's to continue to maintain uh, that very strong relationship that the Department and the Commission has enjoyed with the broader veteran community and, of, of course, through the auspices of our wonderful ex-service organisations that provide a great supporting role within the, uh, the care of our veterans and their families. And the Commissioner also gets involved in commemorative events. 
which brings us on to commemorations. The Department conducts uh, commemorative programs to acknowledge the service and sacrifice of Australian servicemen and women. It is the lead Commonwealth agency for the centenary of ANZAC and it conducts significant commemorative services offshore on ANZAC Day each year, as shown on that slide. We run the service at Gallipoli in Turkey each year in April. I've had the distinct privilege of attending that for the last three years. We share the dawn service with the Kiwis. The Kiwis provide the Master of Ceremonies for the dawn service in the even years. They did last year's and we do uh, the odd years. I did this year and I'll also be the MC in 2015 for the centenary. Uh, we conduct the Australian service at Lone Pine at 10am that same day and I MC that Lone Pine service each year that I've been there and will continue through to 2015 as well. The, the Kiwis, about an hour later, obviously conduct further along Second Ridge Road at Trunic Bear, conduct their own New Zealand service as well later that day. Since 2008, we've been conducting dawn service at Villa Bretonneur on the Western Front and other subsequent services along the Somme Valley. Uh, again, that's run by DVA and a team over there. We conduct the service at Hellfire Pass. Uh, we conduct the service at Sadakan and we conduct a service at Isharava in the last two years with a request for support from the Port Moresby RSL. We're also assisting with the conduct of the Anzac Dawn service at Bamana Cemetery in uh, Port Moresby. Uh, we also conduct commemorative missions for significant anniversaries of previous conflicts, escorting wonderful surviving Australian veterans of these wars to the scenes of their past deeds to attend moving ceremonies. And since I've been in the appointment, we've had, in 2011, in April, four POWs accompanied the Governor-General to Hellfire Pass for Anzac Day. In May that year, we conducted a mission to, uh, for the 70th anniversary of the Greece Creek campaign. Uh, I led that mission. In October that year, for the 60th anniversary of Marion Sang, we took uh, eight wonderful veterans of the Korean War uh, to Korea. In 2012 was a busy year, coinciding with obviously 1942, which is a, a signature year in our second war experience. We had veterans go to Malaya and Singapore for the fall of Singapore in February that year for the 70th anniversary. In June, we took a large contingent of Bomber Command veterans to the UK for the dedication of the Bomber Command Memorial, which is a wonderful experience. In August that year, we had two uh, missions coinciding I, I led the one to Timor in, uh, in August for the Sparrow Force veterans from their experience in 1942. Had a wonderful retired Commodore from the Royal Australian Navy, Red Merson, who was a sub-lieutenant on Voyager the day she ran aground uh, at Batano on the south coast of Timor, as well as veterans of the 2nd, uh, 2nd and the 2nd, 4th independent companies. At the same time, the Deputy President of the Commission led a, a mission to Milne Bay to commemorate the 70th anniversary of that, uh, that battle. In October, I took uh, 18 veterans uh, to Egypt for the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Alamein and immediately backed up in November and took wonderful veterans uh, to PNG for the 70th anniversary of Kokoda and the Battle of the Beachheads. This year, it was the 70th anniversary of the commencement of the work on the Hellfire Pass and the Bur Burma Thai Railway and we had a mission led by John Geary, the Deputy Commissioner here in Melbourne, uh, where four POWs were taken back for Hellfire Pass on Anzac Day. In May, I led a mission to the UK for the 70th anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic. And in July, we just only got back, including John Brownbill is here today, took 15 veterans uh, to Korea for the 60th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice. And it was, again, a wonderful opportunity. So of the 12 missions in the last three years, I've had the very distinct privilege of leading nine of those. Since its establishment 95 years ago, the repatriation system in Australia has evolved through name and legislative change to meet the needs of different generations of veterans. Regardless of changes to the department, DVA's formal role has always been to support the Repatriation Commission in the execution of its duties. Today, the Department has extended this function to the Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Commission to support our latest generation of veterans and remain relevant and responsive to their needs. 
as we enter this period of national commemoration for the centenary of the First World War, in April 2018, we will also have the opportunity to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Repatriation Commission and the Department of Veterans Affairs. In many respects, Australia is unique in having a standalone Commonwealth Department dedicated to support Australian veterans and serving members through a system of care, compassion, compensation and commemoration with benefits and entitlements enshrined in legislation. For nearly 100 years, the Commission and the Department has been serving those who have served. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much for a most interesting summary, eh? Hey. hey. <laughs> I'm sure that Too many pastings are... in North Queensland. I I'm sure that there are some questions to be asked. Go right in. Well, I'll take there's one there first. Yeah, have yours first. Oh, great, sir. Uh, Ron Brandy, RNE yeah. retired. Uh, the question about the former national servicemen who uh, did not have operational service. Yeah. Does the department, your department, have any responsibilities for those who, in some cases, have difficulty in substantiating a claim for, for ill health as a result of their service and training? Can you comment on that at all? Uh, I, I can. It, depending on the, the period that your national service uh, was, was in the 50s or the 60s, it would have predominantly be, co be covered under the Safety Rehabilitation Compensation Act. Uh, but if it can be uh, through um, the claims process be attributed to your service, there should be elements where uh, you have an entitlement. Yeah, I think the biggest problem is uh, uh, for those individuals Sure. Right, thanks, Jack. Um, there's those guys who can't access or there is no substantive documentation to support their injury or claim. I mean, there are many artillerymen in this in this room, no doubt. And the guys that I know, there wouldn't be one that hasn't got hearing. Sure. And generally speaking, many of them are paid for themselves. Yeah. Isolated ones that I know have had it provided, but it seems to be more ad hoc than you know, a process. Sure. Uh, I mean, that, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, uh, but I would recommend those that you know, if they have not engaged with the department, do so, but also go and talk to someone like uh, uh, some of the advocates that work for RSL and some of the other ex-service organisations to seek their assistance yeah. in processing a claim. Thanks, sir. Yeah. We had a question up there. We'll start with one of them and then we might break and go to someone else and come back to your no, other questions. Fine. Um, is there a move to replace volunteer pension officers with professional people uh, in relation to the service of disability claim? In particular, the Merga, um, the rumours out there are that um, most of the volunteer um, pension officers have money dealt with VEA and they're not coping with the Merga. If, if that is the case, where would the professional, what area would they come from? Well, there's a, a couple of parts uh, to answer your question. Uh, the first one is, it's interesting to actually track the claims process with uh, the young men and women who are our contemporary group of veterans, or veterans of the contemporary conflicts. They go to see an advocate, and indeed we've actually taken a big step three years ago now where we have presence from DVA with on-base advisory service, or OBAS as it's referred, and they are being engaged and it's been a great success story and we've cracked the code because it's embraced at Campbell Barracks in Western Australia by the SAS and it's embraced at Holsworthy by the other half of the special operations community. So if you can crack that nut, you crack it anywhere and it's great success at Laverack, Inogra, other big uh, bases. So they are, they, they're shown what they need to do. They don't help them fill out their forms, but they show them all the things they need for processing a claim. The secret is now that we're actually getting claims submitted at time of injury, not 20 years later when people are separating from the service. So if we can actually get that, that whole transition piece will be much easier to manage as far as these guys having a liability accepted for their injury or condition. 
But we've seen great examples in certain regions where the OBAS advisor is then saying, you need to go, if you can't do it yourself, go and seek assistance from the RSL or one of the other ex-service organisations with uh, the support of an advocate. Most of the advocates have been great volunteers over many years, providing support to veterans and widows in their claims process. But they were you know, very strong in one particular piece of legislation, the VA. When it becomes multiple act, it, uh, it, it presents some challenges. We have training courses, et cetera, that have been provided. But these young group of veterans go to see an advocate and they say, show me your credentials. They've been getting you know, financial advice from people and they've been encouraged through a whole series of processes to seek and see the person's credentials. They're asking for credentials. So when there's not credentials, they say, well, I'm not going to have you fill my form out. So that, that presents a challenge in itself, that it's come from the other way. So at the ex-service organisation roundtable, it was indeed the ex-service organisation national presidents who said, we need some form of accreditation. So there is actually a discussion paper out there at the moment being circulated to seek their views on a, a, several models. There's no single model, but several models as to how we best deliver this advocacy welfare support to veterans and that's still the feedback on that is still being received. So there's a number of steps to go through yet, but whether it's a paid service or whether it's a volunteer service that has to then have a more formalised training continuum to continue to be updated so that they can process claims across several acts. And in addition to that, the department is also is online now with my account and the next thing will be online claims submission. Just like you do your bank transfers online, people will actually be submitting claims online and may even take uh, you know, sort of the support out. But, but advocates can be able to do it online as well on their behalf. So there's, there's, there's a lot of work being done in the space. The young veterans are seeking people who are trained and proficient. And we're looking at ways, with support of the ex-service organisations, how to deliver a training continuum that these willing volunteers, or whether they get paid, all those sorts of things will be well, things we'll have to look at once we get the feedback from these, uh, this options paper that's being circulated. One more. One more. You got a question, Nick? Yeah, right here. Yeah. All right. We'll one for the lady right. first. Right. No, one for the lady. <laughs> Thank you. Look, it's Jan Roberts, Lewis, and I must say that I've had tremendous service with Would you speak here. up a bit, please? I've had tremendous service from benefits, including using the Vietnam Veterans Counselling Service. Now the and Veterans and Veterans with Families with Counselling Service. That's not what I'm standing here. Right. Today, because I'm really representing a group of Australians, some of whom were involved in the Battle of the Atlantic. It's the yachtsman scheme men who volunteered to serve the Royal Navy. Now, I've done the majority of the research in that, and I had to use oral history. Keith here, who's one of the yachtsmen, tells me he didn't know about the Battle of the Atlantic commemorations, and only one of the men at Doug Dilling, he was actually went. Well, he's a wonderful man, too. Yes, he's, he's amazing. Wonderful um, man. But I've lost touch with him because he's sort of moved in. No, he's up at Lura on the yeah. Blue Mountains. Oh, Lura. Lura. Thank you. Yep. I'll remember that yep. when I go for the International Fleet Review. We walked through Sydney and he showed me all the buildings he designed as an architect. I know. It's amazing. <laughs> yep. And he has an interesting personal history, I feel, too, which needs to be in the book when I eventually write it. However, what I've been concerned about is there is no... Um, solid commemoration for them. I originally got a grant from Better Fears for $3,000 to help with my oral history. It obviously cost a lot more than that because the only means of resource I had was to interview the surviving veterans. Mm -hmm. And I have tried, I mean, the War Memorial, if they don't qualify, it seems to me we need some recognition of this very, very really courageous group of men. I mean, they're the most highly decorated of any Australian servicemen because it includes the mine disposal guys and, you know, I mean, there's four George Crosses yeah, and thank, I'm, thank you, Jan. George we perhaps have an answer to it. But I would like to talk to you about it or, or yes. see if there's any possibility. Perhaps we can have an answer to that now. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Question at the back? Just a quick one. A lawyer is still precluded from representing veterans at the BRB. Uh, yeah, uh, it's at the Ministry of Appeals Tribunal where you'll see lawyers step in. I mean, the, the, some, it's still the advocates and the veteran. Um, 
I mean, there are some issues about uh, veterans going to law firms if they think that that's their best course of action, because the lawyers are always going to take a big slice of their entitlement. I mean, we have a legislation that has benefits and entitlements for veterans. What we're trying to do is internally change and improve the processes to miss all the uh, all the problems. I mean, we've we've had urban myths out there over the last several years. Sadly, as we've, we've been losing young men in action in Afghanistan, where certain organisations were making the point that war widows had to fight for everything they got. Now, we went out to visit a group at Holsworthy, and it was a hostile crowd, but we said what we need from the young uh, women, the partners, wives, etc., of our young guys killed, once defence allows us to go and see them, and it'll be a period after the, the uh, funeral, is um, a proof of identity, a death certificate and a signature, and 24 hours later the funds flow. So they're not fighting for anything. There is an entitlement there that we extend to them as quickly as we are able to. But that was an urban myth that we were dealing with. But you get lawyers in, in that space, they're going to uh, obviously claim an, uh, a percentage of that. And we want to sort of not include that. But it's not until the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and, and levels of review above that, such as the federal court, that lawyers get involved. That's good. It's just in my day they weren't. I thought it might have changed. No, no. Did you have another one of your three questions? Yeah. I Watsonia RSL, and um, I've been a pension officer since 2006 when I retired. Like the, the year might be out, but it was about 2008 that um, the original cutbacks, as far as the operational budget was concerned, I understand what you said about that. Initially, I could get a claim done and dusted in six to seven weeks. Now it takes close to six months. Are you able to comment on the backlog of? Yeah, it's um, there's actually the numbers of claims has been uh, one of the factors. Uh, the time taken to process is a uh, key performance indicator that is raised by senators of both sides of politics at Senate Estimates Review because it's in the department's annual report and uh, when we don't meet our own uh, KPIs, we are obviously not achieving our aspired time taken to process. And when they are multiple act claims, that increases the challenge. But there is a, a lot of work being done to have all that invisible to the claimant so that it's being done with uh, sort of streamlined processes below. But there's a lot of work being done to do it. We're not perfect yet. But it's actually aimed to do it. Whereas, you know, a, a simple VA claim probably took the time that you described there. But it's when it became multiple act that it actually took time. But we're having things where uh, files weren't replicated, all sorts of things, between states, things like that. But, but behind the, but below the line, a lot of work's been done to streamline the process within the department and the claims processing area to just achieve our aspired end state for the time taken to process claims. Yes. We have it one day. As a member of your first wave category. <laughs> a, a national treasure. I don't, have, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you <laughs> for what you're do, doing for ex service. Well, it's a We're great. Very well served. It's a great pleasure to be here in this position serving you from your generation and our young men and women, of course, the dependents of the guys that we've lost over the last several years on operations overseas as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You have a third. Yeah, it's more an information thing, but at RSLs we, we are told to talk to the young guys and call them contemporary veterans. I was 20 when I went to Vietnam and um, I was wondering what, is, is there some reason why they want to be called contemporary veterans? Well, actually, it's the two national bodies that represented your generation that actually still held very tightly onto the term young veterans. So the Vietnam generation actually still referred to them in, in many uh, fora as the younger veterans compared to the Korean, the Second War, and of course, at the turn of the century, we still had surviving First War veterans, and we still got First War widows. So 
Uh, Ian Campbell, the previous secretary, had been the deputy in the late 90s, early 2000s. He was very conscious of the fact as we were dealing with this post-99 surge of qualifying service entitled um, servicemen and women of the term younger veterans was still embraced and held on tightly by the Vietnam generation. And then we also face situations where people will say that these young men and women don't consider themselves veterans. Well, they don't probably while they're still serving. They will. They think veterans are old people or more developed in years is a more <laughs> pleasant way to say these things. And, uh, and that might be the case. But you know, I presented medals to waves of young men and women. Uh, in, I mean, in the, in the 12 months that I was the commander in the Middle East, the force on any given day was about 24, 2,500 people. But 9,000 people served in the Middle East in that 12 months based on the different lengths of rotations in that 12 months that I was the national commander. So I had, and, and it's wonderful that the system has the medals coming forward before they go. So I had the great privilege of pinning these medals on young men and women. And I gave them their return from active service badge and I'd make the point that gets you into the RSL. And, you know, you're now the new generation of veterans and they took that. But in different sort of uh, meetings and fora, people provide feedback that they don't think of themselves as veterans yet. Some of them, you know, we just generically refer to them as veterans of contemporary conflicts as opposed to contemporary veterans, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with contemporary conflicts. And, uh, and we've got, as I said, from 1999, we've actually produced more than we've produced in the 10 years of the Vietnam War. And there's still young men and women gaining qualifying service as we speak today. Thank you. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Yeah, Certainly. Well, I can assure you from a commemorative perspective, uh, the Chief of Navy is making that uh, quite apparent to everyone that's uh, prepared to listen. And uh, I think the fleet review in Sydney later this year will be one signature event. The actions in Rabaul and the fleet departing mm -hmm. Albany will be our two first commemorative events for the centenary of our service in the First World War next year. Um, and there will obviously be in 2015 aspects of um, uh, the service and the achievement of A2, breaching the Dardanelles. As an aside, Marcus and I had shared Anzac Day on operations in uh, 2009 at the Northgate Cemetery in uh, Baghdad. It was in the red zone of Baghdad because we had Marcus and another guy, Brigadier Simon Gould, in senior operational planning roles in the multinational force Iraq headquarters, the four-star headquarters there. They are actually able to coordinate a security cordon around the Northgate Cemetery. So uh, we went and had a dawn service there, co-hosted by the ambassador uh, to Iraq and myself, and we had the senior coalition generals uh, attend, as well as the ambassadors from the UK, the US uh, and, of course, Australia. The unique aspect of the Northgate Cemetery is that in one corner of the cemetery there is actually a Commonwealth War Graves site. There are 48 Anzacs buried in that cemetery. There are 41 Australians and seven Kiwis. Of the 41 Australians, there were three servicemen from the 9th Battalion, AIF. Now, for those of you who know your history, the 9th Battalion, part of the Australian Brigade, the 3rd Brigade, which had the 9th from Queensland, the 10th from South Australia, the 11th from Western Australia and the 12th from Tasmania, was the first formation to hit the beach at Anzac Cove on the 25th of April. And the 9th proudly claimed being the first battalion on the beach. And its lineage goes to 9RQR. So there were three soldiers there from that battalion. We don't know their history, whether they in fact were captured that first day, but these guys that were buried in that cemetery were captured during the campaign mm -hmm. and worked in prison farms throughout Mesopotamia, now modern day Iraq, and died in captivity. The other unique aspect of the headstones there, there were three crewmen from A2 at, at uh, resting there and they were the only three crewmen that died in captivity. The others were um, 
repatriated after the um, after the war. So it was uh, it was wonderful to be there. It was a unique experience to commemorate Anzac Day while serving on operations. But the Iraqis in the flats that surrounded the cemetery were uh, a, a bit puzzled as to why there was this group of coalition people standing in a cemetery at 4 a.m. <laughs> having a ceremony around a headstone and laying wreaths. But it was something that we'll always remember. Well, thank you very much for your uh, talk, and I would like to uh, ask you to thank you, our speaker in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, well, uh, that was a, a great talk, wasn't it, and uh, a very good summary of the situation over the last 95 years. Uh, this leads on, I suppose, in, in one way, to uh, our next address, which is to be on the 26th of September in this room, and that is going to be by Dr Jim Wood, who is going to talk about soldiers from the wars returning, shell shock to P PTSD. Now, uh, I would like to just make a couple of uh, announcements, I suppose. The first is that I would like to acknowledge the donations that have been made by a number of members. Now, these have been both financial uh, donations, which are always very welcome to help us operate our uh, institute, and also uh, donations in kind of books or other uh, articles that are needed for us to maintain our, our office and our library. To follow that, I suppose, uh, I will ask if anyone has any useful computer equipment that they no longer use, because we're uh, upgrading our computer systems at the moment, and uh, we're in need of some uh, more computer equipment. So if somebody has uh, screens or other equipment in their uh, home that they no longer use and no longer want. I wonder if they could either come and speak to me or to one of the vice presidents or the secretary and uh, we'll see uh, if we can make uh, better use of it than perhaps you are making in your attic. And that uh, leads again, I suppose, to the fact that we have a number of volunteers who willingly come along and assist in our office and library. And if anyone's interested in volunteering, we welcome them to step forward and uh, we'll uh, find something useful for you to do as well. Thank you very much for your attendance today. I look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you very much.